Hello, and welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host this week, Brian Broom, and I'm joined once again by Greg Edinger and Emily Maxson. This week, we are continuing our discussion of the biblical figure of the prophet Elijah. And this time we, you know, last time we talked about who he is. Um, and this week, we're just going to be talking more about uh, the particular ways he served the Lord, contrasting it with another way that a different servant of the Lord served the Lord in his particular uh, position of authority, and the lessons we can glean from that. So uh, let's just hop right into it. Greg, why don't you start? Well, the last, remember last week, Elijah had come before Ahab and said, there's not going to be rain till I say so, and he had vanished. And Ahab had probably ignored him for a while until the rain stopped and stopped and stopped and stopped. The drought was three and a half years long. And someplace in there, the grass was dying, the animals were dying, people were probably dying. And it, it was getting desperate. And Ahab was sending out messages, not only throughout his own kingdom, but to other kingdoms saying, have you seen this guy, Elijah? Got to find him. But Almost as pressing was finding water, not so much for his people, but of all things for his horses. Because you don't have water for horses, you have dead horses, and you don't have a war machine, and neighboring countries come in and conquer you. So it, it starts sort of like this. This is uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. It came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went to show himself unto Ahab. And there was a sore famine in Samaria. Again, or usually is, it seems. And Ahab called Obadiah, which was the governor of his house. This is the other guy we're going to talk about, Obadiah. This is not the Obadiah who wrote the little book of Obadiah. Well, he's the, the governor or the steward of Ahab's house. He works for Ahab, the apostate king. Now, parenthetically, it says, A. Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. It's important to remember that. This is the inspired writer's evaluation of the man's character. Because when we're done, we, we may not be so sure. Or at least we may have a couple questions. For it was so that when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord, that Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifty in a cave and fed them with bread and water, very possibly from Ahab's own table or resources. <clears throat> well, upon a day, Ahab said to Obadiah, Go into the land, unto all the fountains of water, into all the brooks, peradventure we may find grass to save the horses and mules alive, that we lose not all the beasts. Notice he's more concerned for the animals than finding water for the people. So they divided all the land between them to pass throughout it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, I've never checked the commentators on this. Maybe you two will, will have an idea. I don't know why a king is out there by himself with his steward. The two most powerful people in the kingdom are out there, unattached, un, unescorted, looking for water. Um, Maybe because I don't know. It, 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 it could like, be a top secret mission. Yeah, you well, don't that, want everyone else to come in and get the that water. That was my first thought. Okay, well that that sounds good. I, I I would go with that because normally these people would have whole entourages, but for some reason, just the two of them. And yeah, perhaps they don't. They're hoping they're going to get lucky enough and they're going to find something. And okay, don't want other people. Oh, I like that. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him, and he knew him, and fell on his face and said, "Art thou that?" My lord, Elijah, very respectful. He doesn't say, are you that guy, Elijah? Are you that, uh, my lord, Elijah? He knew him in the sense that he recognized him. Uh, it doesn't seem that they had actually met face to face, uh, or at least knew each other at any personal level. Because, yeah, because of the question, are, are you the guy we've been looking for? Are you that Elijah we've been looking for? But the description had been, there's this hairy guy who girds on his clothes with a leather belt. Nazarite, most likely. And so here he is. And uh, Obadiah, you're Elijah, aren't you? And he answered, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Elijah always gets cold lines. 
And he said, What have I sinned that thou wouldest deliver thy servant into the hand of Ahab to slay me? And I think we should all go, what? <laughs> what, 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 huh? What are you talking about? Well, he, he, he has it reasoned out. Here's his, his, here's his thought process. And he gives us some background. As the Lord thy God liveth, there is no nation or kingdom whither my Lord hath not sent to seek thee. And when they said, he's not there, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they found thee not. And now thou sayest, go, tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and it shall come to pass, as soon as I'm gone from thee, the Spirit of the Lord shall carry thee whither I know not. And, and so when I come and tell Ahab, and he cannot find thee, you'll slay me. A little bit of paranoia going on here. Ahab then is again, he probably knows Ahab really, well, really well. <laughs> that, you got a point there. You got a point. Uh, Ahab has been looking desperately for light. Remember that Ahab's thought patterns are magical. He's bought into Baal worship. And what he sees here is not an ethical problem, his own disobedience and covenant apostasy. His, in his mind, the problem is Elijah. He is basically a, a sorcerer for the other side. And if we kill the sorcerer, we stop the problem. And the problem is now devastatingly serious. People are dying. Animals are dying. There's no let up. There's no clouds in the sky. We have no solution. Obviously, the best thing to do is to find this guy and kill him. And so he's been sending all the nations round about and extracting oaths from their, their kings to the effect that they have not found him. He was actually, and we skipped over this story. I'm not sure why I skipped over it in the original uh, articles I wrote. But uh, the story we, we, we skipped over, God had sent him first to an out-of-the-way brook where birds fed him, unclean birds, scrap table scraps or something that they got someplace. And uh, he drank of the brook, but the brook dried up because drought. And then, he, um, and then he went into Phoenician territory to Jezebel's backyard, and God had a, a Phoenician woman, widow woman, feed him there by miracle. So he's been hiding kind of under Jezebel's nose, but they, they've tried really hard to find him and they can't. And so Obadiah's thinking is, uh, he is so just upset and out of his mind over this, that if I say, here he is, and here you're not, because who knows what God would do? You're one of those spiritual guys and weird things happen and you'll just vanish. God will teleport you someplace. And uh, I'll, be the, I'll be the one there. And so when he, he can't kill you, he'll kill me just because he'll be in a killing mood. But he says this, but I, thy servant, fear the Lord from my youth. I grew up fearing God. Was it not told my Lord, because these things get around, don't they? What I did when Jezebel slew the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by 50 in a cave. And fed them with bread and water. And we're being told this the second time. Uh, we're not told what the, where the cave was. We're not told how many prophets Jezebel actually killed, but apparently a lot because this was a remnant. It's interesting that Israel, the northern kingdom, in its apostasy, had lots of prophets God had sent, or prophets in training, basically pastors, uh, but who would have the gift of, of inspired revelation at times. God's servants, God's covenant lawyers, and uh, Obadiah has, has hidden them. And Jezebel can't find them and doesn't know about them. He's actually feeding them with whatever resources he has, and whether it's directly from Ahab or simply out of his own salary, which Ahab pays. Anyway, Ahab, if he knew about this, would not be happy, let alone Jezebel. So knowing that, knowing I'm on your side and I've tried to do what I could, and, I, and you're going to put my life in danger? And now thou sayest, go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here, and he shall slay me. Okay. Well, Elijah says, as the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, and I will surely show myself unto him today. So, encouraged by the word of the Lord, Obadiah goes, he went to meet Ahab, told him. Ahab went to meet Elijah. And I just have to read this because, as I say, Elijah gets all the great lines, except that Ahab gets a few. And here's one of them. Came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troublest Israel? 
And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that you've forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Balaam. Now, and he proposes a whole elaborate contest that we'll talk about, I imagine, next time. Which Obadiah probably arranged because he's the governor and steward and would have the resources and send the messages and such. Had a hand in it, most likely. But, you know, anybody, any competent manager could have done that part of it. What he did, the one thing he did, the one evidence we have that this Obadiah feared the Lord, was that he took on the risky assignment of hiding the Lord's pastors, the Lord's prophets, when a purge was going on, when there was a death sentence on them all. Um, and he, and, and probably had to cut some corners and tell some fibs and um, allocate resources that may not exactly have been his to allocate and do things that his employers would most certainly have objected to had they known. But it was all quiet. It was all on the sly. And, and every night he could go home and with some degree of ease, kiss his wife and have dinner, go to bed and go back to work the next day. Whereas Elijah has been on the run, first in the wilderness, being fed by birds, and then in Gentile territory, far away from the life of God's people. And, and the thing I would like to talk about is how these two men might see each other. Here's Elijah, the, the fanatic, the rabble rouser, the firebrand, the guy who stirs up trouble who calls for famine and, and starts all kinds of trouble, makes it difficult on everybody. And here's Obadiah, compromiser, living in comfort while the prophet suffers. Where's his witness? Where's his testimony? What difference has he made? Well, he made some, as it seems. And, and rather than go on about this, I would rather turn to you two and say, um, what would you say for or against these guys or for some balance in between. What do, you, what do you think and why do you think there might be a problem here? I think for any individual, there's one side or the other that seems preferable mm. because mm. We're, we're all different people. We all have different gifts. And it's tempting to look at our situation from our perspective and say, well, then there has to be one right answer. And mm. I think it's yeah. going to be this. Whereas someone else, A, is in a different situation because they're not you. And then B, has different gifts. And the Lord works through all of the gifts that he gives to his people. Yeah. It's really easy to say we all, we all need to be like Martin Luther. But the issue is that nobody but Martin Luther was Martin Luther. <laughs> yeah. um, somebody had to be Zwingli. <laughs> somebody had, let's hope none of us have to be Zwingli. Um, <laughs> it's a joke. It's a joke. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I forget exactly where I read it, but I read something this week that got at that same point, which was essentially to say, if you look at a situation and essentially say, actually, I remember where, where it was. It was in a sermon from 2006 on Romans 7, I think it was, by R.C. Sproul. Mm -hmm. And he basically said, you, you have a very strong temptation as a, as a believer to take your own personal experience as a believer in sanctification, in the course of sanctification, to say, well, because I haven't struggled with this, anyone who does is a weaker believer. Mm. They're not as sanctified as I am, even though they may have other issues. And he he used the example that um, ever since he was converted, ever since he came to Saving Faith, he had really never had any struggle with wanting to read scripture. And so for the mm -hmm. longest time, this is, this is R.C. Sproul talking, he said for the longest time, he had a prideful issue where he looked at these other people who struggled to read and mm -hmm. struggled to find the joy in the simple act of reading the word and thought, what's wrong with these people that they, they don't <laughs> love this? Mm. And what actually really, really applies to what I was thinking of as we were, you were just reading this, uh, this story of um, Elijah and Obadiah is he said, the difference is those other people that have the trouble, they weren't called like me 
to be a pastor of God's word. Mm -hmm. God gave me a gift and a love for this so that I didn't find it difficult to study the word that I was called then to preach to others. Mm -hmm. And I think in the example that we have of Elijah and Obadiah as well is that Obadiah wasn't necessarily called to live in the wilderness, sustaining off of food brought by birds, partially because he didn't have the level of authority that Elijah had as a prophet of God. Mm -hmm. He didn't have that same level of spiritual authority and responsibility that he did. And so it came down to what he, like what his calling was, what his duty was in the position that God had placed him. I think one thing we could say in criticism of Obadiah, or that I would say in criticism of Obadiah, is something you brought up or mentioned in passing, which is that he never reminded Ahab of his covenant duties as king. That is one thing I think that I, 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 uh, my personal opinion at this point uh, would be to say <laughs> that that was wrong of him. Uh, that was wrong of Obadiah to not ever risk uh, the anger of the king in that particular way. Even if it was in the most gentle and prodding of terms. <laughs> he, I think that because of where he was placed, he had that sort of responsibility. But that's not to say that because he wasn't also living in the wilderness and also suffering in the same ways that Elijah was, that he was somehow in sin for that. Yeah. I think there's also an aspect of this that is a question of degrees, like mm -hmm. comparable to when you're laying out a budget. And you're thinking, all right, I'll pick an example from David's in my life because it's ready to hand that, <laughs> you know, we want to be saving for our new baby's education. Now, how much of that is going to be put towards her elementary school education? How about her high school education? How about her college education? Mm -hmm. College is by far the most expensive. But if she gets there and we've not put anything towards the stuff along the way, is it really going to do her any good? <laughs> so right. thinking of now and thinking of later are both important and you have to put dollars toward both. So what do you do? And there isn't a straightforward answer that applies to all situations. And when the time comes, will you even choose college given right. the condition <laughs> yeah. of modern colleges? <laughs> right. Um, if I'm alive, maybe you just send it to me. Um, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, the, the, there are many like things where we can see, as you say, time priorities. What's, what's important now as opposed to what's going to be important in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years? Uh, as far or 100 as, years. Or 100 years. As far as, as Obadiah, we're not told he never said anything to Ahab. Mm -hmm. And, again, there are degrees of... Uh, your majesty, uh, it would be in accord with God's law to do this and so. And Ahab turns and glares at him with those eyes that shine red, you know. And he, Okay, <laughs> I won't be saying that again. Um, I, think, I think there might also be another aspect, which is, <clears throat> is it just for somebody who is – well, I don't know what the, the term is, but, you know, essentially an enlisted officer in the Schutzstaffel, the SS, yeah, and yeah. is using his uh, Third Reich-provided salary to buy food for the Jews that are living in his cupboard at home. <laughs> yes. Is it a wise decision or a prudent or even a, um, you know, a life-sustaining decision in the sense of the Sixth Commandment to for him to – Turn to his SS comrade and go, you know, do you really think we should be doing this? I don't think God's <laughs> law really says that we should be killing people like this. <laughs> because yeah, now dude. he's not only jeopardized his own life, but he's jeopardized all the people that he's hiding from a right. dangerous and violent and murderous government as well. <laughs> Elijah and could take the explicit wrath of the king because he didn't have 500 prophets <laughs> or 100 <laughs> prophets' lives riding on him. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Very, very different kinds of circumstances, very different kind of responsibilities. And of course, Elijah had an express commandment from God to go stand before the king, both first and now. Uh, th there is a pietism that has been at work in the American church for a long time that hates dilemmas like this. 
It wants a clear cut, black and white. Always do it this way. Any, as you said earlier, anyone who doesn't uh, is spiritually immature or, or morally compromised. It's not living the full Christian life. It's not sold out to Jesus. And we want to know what that is. And then we condemn anybody who hasn't done it. Oh, man. Doesn't this go back to the the Puritans and the Separatists? <laughs> like, this well, is it America. Did, it did, Probably it did, before it, that. Yeah, it did occur to me <laughs> earlier on that that would be one such example. There are those who say, this place is so bad, we must leave and we must leave now. Reform without tarrying for any. And there are others who say, but this is the church where we were baptized, that we, to which we've made our covenant vows, the church of our fathers. There are still many godly believers here. We can still turn this around. God and we must. And we, we must. must not leave. And we Do must we not try? leave. Yeah. And then a few years later, you find them living across the bay from each other. Like, <laughs> right. Wait. <laughs> wait a second. We're reforming from a distance. It's it, uh-huh. it, yeah. Uh-huh. We did what you did, but we did it for different reasons. <laughs> uh, so we were right <laughs> and you were wrong. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think either of us is to a certain degree either a Puritan or a pilgrim, a separatist. We sometimes we just say that we're done here. We're so out of here. And then there are others who others of us who want to stay and fight to the end, or at least hold on to the end, mm. be the last ones kicked out of the building, as it were. <laughs> uh, and and God works in all of these things. Yep. And 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 to say no, this is the way, and anybody who didn't do it this way has failed God, has failed the gospel, has failed Christ. It really requires a great deal of arrogance and or naivety and simplicity of mind. Yep. Uh, some people in, in their immature Christian faith are are really very simple minded, and they and, and you can give them that, you know. Okay, so she sees it as this black and white. Well, you know, I haven't been a very Christian a Christian very long, or she hasn't been in a church that's really taught sound doctrine that really taught the Bible. I can see why she makes it really simple, but there are others who ought to know. And but there's also to, like the Lord uses that black and white person too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And, and 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 that in itself is kind of the point, right? Uh, Elijah and Obadiah didn't point fingers at each other, but probably there are people we could find who did, and <laughs> God continues to use them anyway. He used the separatists and he used the Puritans, um, and both oddly enough in America eventually. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to talk for a moment about uh, political applications because this is very much that kind of thing. Obadiah worked for the state. He held a, a bureaucratic, cushy state job. He wasn't elected. He was appointed. Somehow he had done something to get Ahab's notice. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe been promoted up through the ranks. Maybe done some great one-time service kind of thing. Anyway, he got put in, in this office by the king. And he is responsible for handling a great deal of money that has been collected one, by taxes, some lawful, some not, by confiscation of property, mostly not remotely legal, you know, and whatever else, and, and also any proceeds that come from aggressive wars that they have may have started along the way. And probably any um, any of the funds that were taken from slain prophets of Yahweh. Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. So we look at this guy and we say, okay, fine, we understand you can't stand up to... Ahab, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, and begin witnessing right off the top of your head and calling them, you can, but you won't get very far and you'll probably be dead before you get to the Jesus saves part. But shouldn't you at least quit? Shouldn't you, aren't you tainted by the blood, by the greed, the covetousness, the pure secularism, the paganism? You're doing a great job as a steward, but what you're doing a great job of is sustaining an absolutely tyrannical pagan anti yahwist government in power, and they're doing a much better job than they would if you weren't there. So quit. How could you work for the military-industrial complex? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, and sometimes that's a hard question. Mm-hmm. I I told you before we started that I have one example, and you, you you assured me you had more, so get ready. But when I was <laughs> when I was a kid, there were uh, a couple ladies in our church um, who were roommates, and one worked in some kind of some kind of office in in the county government or some such thing. I don't know what she did exactly, 
The other, I think, was an art teacher. And this kind of discussion came up in Sunday school or some kind of Bible study kind of thing. And, and the one the one lady who worked for the state said out loud to everybody, you know, I, I really, I, I don't really see what purpose I'm fulfilling in God's kingdom with the job I have working in a state bureaucracy for a pagan government. And her roommate said, well, it, it's easy. You're helping the state enslave us all. Oh, <laughs> uh, that's mean, yeah, but well, also true. <laughs> and, and, and there was and there was a little laughter, but I think it may have stung a little bit. I, I've certainly remembered it ever since. That's not a good answer. I mean, mm-hmm. There may be some truth in it, but there, you know, Daniel worked for Nebuchadnezzar. Mm-hmm. He was not a nice guy. Daniel did not say, I'm not working for you. Kill me if you have to. But, you know, death first over serving such a pagan as yourself, sir. <sighs> the, the three Hebrew children eventually drew that line, but only when they were asked to bow down to an idol. It was, uh, and, and Daniel served faithfully under Cyrus slash Darius until the whole, well, you can't pray to Jehovah anymore came up. These men all work for pagan kings or at least marginally, well, extremely compromised kings. And they didn't quit. They didn't walk away. And a lot of the money that passed through their hands was not lawfully obtained in any godly covenantal sense. Yeah. I mean, what we're really seeing is a, you know, God is consistent throughout all time with his own words, obviously. We're seeing the initial kind of aspect of what Romans 13 talks about, about Mm -hmm. even governments which are not explicitly covenantally unified or under Christ explicitly. They still bear a legitimate kind of authority, and they have their legitimate use in the societies of men. It's not something you can just say, well, because XYZ policy or ruler or whatever, we can completely discount your authority doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. They're still instituted by God. And they bear the responsibility of that. That's on them. Anything that they do that's wrong, they will bear that responsibility. It's it doesn't lessen the existence of the authority. I mean, Romans 13 Mm -hmm. does say he doesn't bear the sword in vain. He has the sword. It's a real sword. It can stab you. (laughs) He has it. The authority is there, and it's something that God does give to them. If they misuse the sword that they have that is not in vain, then that falls on them. And that's why uh, kingdoms like Ahab's fall under God's judgment is because they have abused that authority. It's why kingdoms like Greece and Babylon and Medo-Persia and Rome all fall Mm -hmm. eventually is because of that. What you were saying reminded me of something from the New Testament, the Gospels. When John the Baptist was preaching in the wilderness, various classes of people came to him and Luke gives us some of his very specific answers, and I think I think they apply here. Then came this is uh, Luke three twelve. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? <clears throat> and he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. Mm. He didn't say, Well, you're collecting for Rome. The money you're collecting is going to fund the lifestyle of that. Crazy, bisexual, polytheistic, uh, God-hating beast on the throne, and in a few years going to be used to, it's going to be turned on Jerusalem and then on the church. So you obviously have to get out of this profession right now. Didn't Mm -hmm. say that. He just says, within the scope of your job, don't steal. Mm -hmm. Just do the job honestly. Then and that was, is very black and white, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Here are the schedules set for you by the by Rome. Don't take more than you're supposed to. Because they, they then, were allowed, like they were at least not penalized by Rome for taking more, right? Oh, no, that was that They didn't was even kind have of, to tell Rome. Yeah, they, just, they, they, they were given a basic amount and you have to get this and anything you get above that, it's kind of yours. Ah, okay. So th- there, there would have to be a certain degree of, of, of self-judging and self-honesty of, well, what, what exactly um, am I supposed to? What, what exactly has been appointed? Yeah. I got to live. I got to maintain a household. Um, 
So that that might require some some economic and financial thinking and some some spiritual honesty. And yet it it is in a sense pretty black and white. Stop stealing. Stop grinding the poor. Stop oppressing people. You can have your job. Just do a good, honest job at it. The yeah, the government thing, is doing all these things, is oppressing people. Yeah. But you're not supposed to. <laughs> you're not. Yeah, don't, don't, don't join in what they're doing. The next group are soldiers. These are probably soldiers of King Herod because it's unlikely that Roman soldiers at this point would, would ask this question, although they might. The soldiers likewise demanded of him, see, they're soldiers, so they make demands, saying, <laughs> and what shall we do? And he said unto them, do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. <laughs> don't lie, don't envy. <laughs> yeah. And don't steal. Yeah, and don't, and, yeah, don't beat and up people. don't kill. Yeah. yeah. It, real simple kinds of things. But again, what he does not say is you're working for Herod. Herod is uh, an apostate pretending to be a Jew. He's an Endomian and an Edomite. He's a very wicked man. Uh, he's about to murder John the Baptist. In fact, he's murderous in his wickedness. And he's an adulterer and guilty of incest at that. So what do you guys think you're doing supporting his regime? Obviously, you have to quit immediately. On the other hand, nor does he say, well, you need to go back to Herod and bear witness to him of your changed lives and invite him to my preaching. <laughs> no suggestion that just, in other words, you have a job. Don't take the possible, what would be the word, advantages that that job may bestow upon you to do evil, mm -hmm. to, to acquire wealth for yourself or power or to express your pride and ambition serve people, serve the guys who are over you, serve the people around you, don't beat people up, don't lie about them to get stuff, and interestingly, be content with your wages. Yeah. Don't I mean, go he's on just strike. Holding up, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't go on strike. In a sense, he's just holding up the Ten Commandments, yeah. right? Yeah, I was going to say, he just keeps pointing back. Yeah. Like, this is not new material. Yeah, but what's what's interesting? There's that, and that is interesting. That it's not new, and it's not complicated, and it's not there's not some deep dark secret, although they seem to think there was. But on the other hand, what he doesn't tell them is equally important. He does not say, "Stop working for Rome, stop working for Herod, stop supporting the system, start get out of the system. You must flee it. That's worldly." He does not say those things. It is possible that some of them did eventually. We know that Matthew left his occupation as tax collector, but Jesus called him to that very specifically. There's no evidence that Zacchaeus gave up uh, being a tax collector, though he did make full restitution fourfold for anything he'd ever stolen, and then he gave away half of his goods to the poor on top of that. Hmm. Um, so the gospel does bring real character change in terms, of, in terms of some very basic commandments that came down from Mount Sinai. And yet, it doesn't necessarily pull people out of what might seem to be compromised occupations or callings, because God can still use servants even here. Even if you can't walk up to your boss and say, boss, you got a minute, I want to tell you about Jesus. <clears throat> Some of us can do that. Some of us would be fired before we got very far, depending Some on... Of us some of us don't have to because we work for Christian bosses. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but like you would also not want to be stealing time, like witnessing right, right. on company time is right, yeah. not yeah. what you're paid for. Exactly. Yeah. Um, doing your Bible study on company time. Well, you know, I can get done. Uh, this is a semi real example. I know a, a gentleman who said something like this. I can get done with my work easy. I mean, everyone else is so lazy and slow, and I can get my work done and get it done well and still have this free hour when I really, my work's done. So I, I, uh, the temptation here is just to, you know, use my phone and do some Bible study for about an hour. I finally realized that's wrong because hmm. I've done what was required of me, but they're still being paid. It's not my time. I should find ways to do more than is expected of me. Yeah. Not just stop at the bare minimum. Is it the There's parable of the there. talents where yeah. the the king comes back and says, you're a wicked servant because you did only what was asked or only what was required? Yeah. Yep. Um, and, and particularly in the parable of the talents, you wasted 
time. I gave you resources mm-hmm. and you did nothing. And that time can't be bought back. Yep. Uh, which again, is, is a side issue to this whole thing of we don't all work for Christian employers. We don't all work in a Christian organization where uh, covenant faithfulness is more or less the norm. Most of us either do or have at some point worked in organizations where unbelief is the norm. Profit motive drives all. People may be nice. They may not be nice. Mm -hmm. They may be profane, but nice. They (laughs) may be professing Christians and really vicious, you know, you, 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 the wheat and tares of life. Yep. And and sometimes these businesses are doing good and sometimes they're not. And when it's the state, it's a mixed bag. Our schools got a call from two nice health officials. They were very nice and polite, but basically told us, here's the rules about vac- just normal, not COVID, but just normal vaccinations for this coming year. And all of your people who have these exemptions, most of them are running out. So you need to disenroll them if they won't get them. Like, thanks so much. We're glad you were nice about it. But um, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, th- mm-hmm. But then our, our church, when our church was reopening in, in the middle of COVID, we, we were having church and a neighbor reported us. And so we got uh, a notice from the local health department that said, I- I'm sorry. And the guy was nice, apparently. I mean, you you, you got to close. You can't do this. You can't, you, you don't, you have too many people meeting in too small an area. And um, yeah. And our pastor tried to explain the precautions we were taking and and all that. And I'm, you know, I'm sorry, but that's the law says you, you got to close. Thanks. And so he, the pastor brought it back to the spiritual council. And he said, well, oh, hmm. And we were about to debate how we were going to respond. And one of the other elders, and I was thankful that it was another elder, not me, <laughs> said, well, you know, we've been told this, but no one showed up at the door to put a padlock on it. Why don't we wait hmm. and just see what happens? And if they come, then that's one thing. If they don't, that's something else, maybe. And so we waited. And about a week later, the same guy called back our pastor and said, OK, just checking up on this. You do understand that you were in uh, you were not in compliance and you know what you have to do. Right. Yes. You've told us. Good. Well, I'm marking this file closed and uh, <laughs> have a nice day. And that was that. And we never heard from them again. I it may be that the guy was lazy. It may be that he was a Christian and just protecting us. We we have no idea why someone would just blind, blindly assume, especially at that period when things were up in the air, would just blindly assume that because he had told us to comply, we had when we didn't really say we had. And he didn't really <laughs> ask us, have you complied? It wasn't that he was trusting our word. He was just telling us, I have told you we are done now. <laughs> I have other to go. <laughs> you signed the form that says you received these other forms. Uh, yeah, pretty and, much. Yeah. So it reminds me of Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> Oh, yes. I've delivered the message. That is the extent of my job description. Have a nice day. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So here we have a guy. I don't, maybe he was a Christian. Maybe he was just a nice guy who figured this is too much hassle. Tell them and it's on them and no one's going to check up. I'm sure the neighbor has better things to do than come back. So (laughs) it's a bold assumption. Yeah. yeah, Well, it, it may have been. He may have been risking something. But if the neighbor did come back, it's reported to his superior. Don't know. Mm-hmm. We don't so much we don't know, and it, it is it is interesting. You spoke earlier of, of uh, anti Nazis within the uh, the German organization during World War II. Uh, I'm sure every now and then people would run into, oh wait, you're German underground. Oh wait, you're you have a Jewish grandmother. Oh wait, you are a Christian pastor. What? You know, there were people within the Nazi hierarchy who still were very quiet and still could look the other way at just the right time. They didn't draw attention to themselves, but they made uh, escape and uh, avoidance possible at times. Yeah. And and so, you know, you know, you don't know what good can you do there? We don't know. Yes. On and there's the one some hand, requirements. And if you're in that situation, mm-hmm. you have to be content to let people believe that you are complicit in all these wicked things. Yeah. Yeah. And that can be a hard thing. I want to say something, but the moment I say something, then 
all the laser sights go on my forehead. Yeah, and all these people have been helping. I won't be able to help anymore. So where's the line? And we're back to I, I, which the thing I think is probably our premise tonight. Where's the line? It's going to depend. A, it kind of depends. And that's going to be between you and God based upon your opportunities, your gifts, your calling, where God has placed you, the providential events that have surrounded you. If God has made it possible for you to help 20 people, that might be a sign that God has, that God's going to help you with 20 more. On the other hand, if you tried to help one person bungle it and almost got your family killed, then maybe you're not the person to be doing this. <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, sometimes, sometimes God's people do say, yes, I almost got my family killed, but I will do it again because this issue is worth literally worth dying for. But that's a call of conscience. Yeah. We have to be very, very careful in trying to force that of other people or judging other people in terms of it. Especially yeah. 10 or 20 years after the fact. Because <laughs> we can be living on our little memories of how great our victories were and how we never backed down and we never denied Christ and the world has passed us by and gone in different directions. Uh, and so is the church. Yep. And God's moving in a different way. We, we need to look and say, I did what I did. And God will judge me. God will judge them. In the meantime, what's next? What's my next assignment? What's the next move? Yep. Uh, we can't always be living in the past and balancing our choices against other people's choices. We, we get to choose in the moment and then commit it to God. And all mm -hmm. of our works are marred by sin and imperfection, mm -hmm. but God receives them for Christ's sake of faith. And sometimes we just have to be content with that. Not only for ourselves, where it's a little easier for most of us, but also for other people. Yeah, yeah. God's working on him too. So I, I, I leave him to God. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, an, another example that I, I can think of um, in the week that we're recording this, we're about three days after a leak from the Supreme Court regarding the uh, the, the Supreme Court's decisions regarding the, the um, I don't know what you'd call it, the status, efficacy, legality of Roe v. Wade, which is mm -hmm. most famous for being the uh, the abortion uh, decision. And I, I found this really interesting question, which was, you know, you have a magic wand and it, it can give you one of, one of two um, outcomes. And the one is the, the rate of abortions stay, stays the same, but it's illegal. Mm -hmm. Or it stays legal, but through whatever other means, it's like one tenth or even right. eliminated. Which one do you choose? And I'm not a huge fan of those kind of false dilemma things, even with magic yeah. wand uh, <laughs> apparatuses being uh, in in view. Another example, which he the same person uh, offered forth, was you have a hundred dollars spare, mm -hmm. just whatever it is. You you got really good stocks that month or something. Do you spend it? on a pro-life politician's campaign or do you give that hundred dollars to a local pro-life ministry of some sort mm -hmm. which one's going to have the better effect which one is going to actually make the change you want and actually i think the answer is that's going to depend <laughs> yeah it and is. it's not a thing you can say Everyone needs to do option one or everyone needs to do option two in fact you might even say I'm going to take 50 and give it to one and 50 and give it to the other or 75 to one. And or 25 I'm taking my family out to pizza tonight. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> maybe your family uh, needs the pizza. That's a legitimate yeah, option. Yeah, maybe my families work really hard serving God this week and they need a break and they need to rejoice before the Lord. There was this thing called exactly. rejoicing ties. Uh, with regard to exactly. your first choice, I do want to make a comment just because you brought it up and it really sure. doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about. So declare abortion illegal, but not have any major effect or stop abortions while leaving it legal. I think probably the, the gut instinct is, well, we want to save the babies and, mm -hmm. and uh, completely understandable. And I'm not sure that that's not what I would choose, but I do want to point this out. There is, there's something else at stake here mm -hmm. besides the lives of those particular babies. And it's this. A nation in its public policy setting itself against God. Right. Yes. Because abortion took place before it was legalized. 
Mm-hmm. But the nation and the government was opposed to it and was doing what it could to drive it underground. It was just in large degree successful. I heard something like 75% of states had complete bans on it. Yeah. Yeah. Like in 1972. Yeah. But then we turned around and told God, we're going to murder babies and there's nothing you can do about it. At that point, it's, does the it's number somehow of somehow not his business? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Well, you know, we have this right to privacy thing, and really God (laughs) doesn't have any right to our privacy. That's what it means. Well, that's what it means. And when we say that covenantally through our elected officials, Mm -hmm. just because we're saving the lives of the babies doesn't mean that they're not going to be killed. When the wars come and the plagues come and God says, enough of your apostasy, I'm going to get your attention. It's at least something to consider here. Oh, for Mm -hmm. sure. And it's not a way that most Christians normally do think. No, no, I'm not. I'm not, I'm, I'm not picking a side here. I'm just pointing out it, the decision may not be as simple as some people think it is. Absolutely, which is why I brought in the second, yeah, uh, clarification because I don't like either option for yeah. for those exact reasons. Even though I would yeah. absolutely love for the number to be zero of well, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. abortions, it doesn't change the fact that if we're stating you can still do this and it would be okay, that's wrong. That's that is no. something that has deleterious. That's the word I was looking for. <laughs> spiritual effects. No, I, mm-hmm. and sanction covenanted effects. That yeah. gets angry. Uh, one one last thing. I'm looking at my notes, and one last thing I do see. Um, just just stepping back uh, during the oh I don't know uh, 80s. I guess starting in the late 70s with the election of Jimmy Carter on into the 80s. We saw for a brief time a big push on, among fundamentalist and evangelical Christians to get back into politics, which is not in itself certainly a bad thing. Um, well, obviously, you want to put up some caveats and, and let's not confuse America with the church and mm-hmm. God's law with American tradition, all that. Yeah, we know that. Yeah, we got that. But sometimes Christians are a little naive as to how much effect they can have once they get into office. Not to say they can have no effect. I know a gentleman whose name I will not use on our podcast because he's got enough political enemies already. And he, if he's listening, as he may well be, I know his daughter probably is. Uh, he's got enough enemies. He doesn't need any help from me. Uh, I know how much as a Christian working behind the scenes in the previous administration, he was able to accomplish he had the presidents here, and the president was pro-life, and there were a lot of things that they were able to do that never hit the press because, you know, the president's waving his right hand over here and the left hand's doing something else. Uh, and my friend was there able to, to get some stuff done. But by and large, most young people who get into politics with this vision of, I'm going to go out there and change the world and never compromise – are sadly disappointed. Even if they remain faithful to their vision and calling, they find out that, one, the government bureaucracy has an incredible slow momentum of itself that's almost impossible to reverse in four years or eight years or 10 years. Mm -hmm. Uh, That in order to get along, along, you have to give in here and there. And if you're not going to compromise, your effectiveness is going to be compromised. Yeah. Uh, and, and such things. It's just it's it's hard for one or two or 10 people, however well-intentioned, however dedicated to Christ to accomplish anything. And then there's this. The government is lousy at almost everything it does. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's face it. God gave it a sword and it's, it can be great at blowing up cities. But short of that. It's it not, might even blow up the wrong cities. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, it does that on occasion. Yeah, you know, it does it's, it a lot. Yeah. It's not terribly competent about much of anything, much less about fixing the culture. Mm-hmm. And so to go to mm-hmm. it with the hopes that we're going to bring about reform from a from a political point of view or political power and leverage, it, it's not really what the gospel ever tells us. It, it, yes, there are phrases like Kings will be your nursing fathers and queen your nursing mothers, and the kings will bring their glory and honor to the New Jerusalem and such. But that's a little bit of help along the way. That's not so you want to you want to materialize this promise to Abraham, go become a king, conquer lots of countries. It's not that's not the way it works. It doesn't work that way. And uh, politics doesn't save anybody, and it doesn't save any nation, and it doesn't fix 
deeply rooted spiritual and cultural problems. It's nice to have some people in office who are not insane and not terribly wicked. And if they're there, stay there and do what you can. But let's understand that a pastor preaching faithfully to a small flock may have a much, much greater impact on the next generation than someone who gets to be vice president. Mm -hmm. That's just the reality of God's world. Mm -hmm. Obadiah mostly just did stuff that anybody could have done, and he didn't turn the world upside down. But one thing he did is he risked his life to hide some prophets who may or may not have survived the purge afterwards when, when Elijah won, because Elijah's going to say, I'm the only one left. Did he not know about them? Or when he won his contest with Baal, did they come out in the open? The text isn't completely clear about that. So Obadiah did what he could, and we remember, we remember him, not for how he kept Ahab's administration running, but that he saved the lives of some preachers. Mm -hmm. And that's what God was concerned about. Well, I think that's a good place to wrap things up for this call. Let's do recommendations. I hear Emily has one. I have heard that I as well. Do. Yes, the rumors are confirmed. <laughs> um, my recommendation is the book Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. Ah, excellent. <laughs> um, I've been reading it with my ninth graders and having some really interesting discussions. I'm so proud of them. They're making connections that I hadn't made. And that's just something cool about teaching high schoolers. Um, it's a very easy to read book. Maybe not if you are super into grammar being all correct and formal. <laughs> uh, but if you're into a neat story with some really interesting ideas and characters, it's a good one. Lovely. Okay. I have two. My first one is the more serious of the two, uh, which is I'm going to recommend that you not make false, red herring, confusing, and unbiblical shibboleths for what constitutes Christian action. This sounds like a subtweet. It partially <laughs> is. I, I'm going to leave it at that. But let's just let's just say that um when we turn anything outside of truth that we find in scripture into a measure of faithfulness, we are on very dangerous ground. All right. Well, I've got one then. Oh, sorry. With... I do have a second one. All right. We'll go with your second one. But I'll, I'll I apologize. Give me an idea. No, no, no. Uh, give me an idea there, there, there is a wonderful essay that I found, and I must admit that I am only about six pages into it because of lack of time. But the concept is very good so far. It is called... A Mathematician's Lament, and the author is Paul Lockhart. And it's very funny because uh, the intro is uh, two, two nightmares, one that is had by a musician and one that is had by an artist. And in both, uh, the, well, the, mu the musician's nightmare is, well, music is, it's mandatory. Everyone has to study music. But of course, we need them to understand the sheet music first, and, and that's the most important thing. They can't understand anything about music unless they know that. And maybe once they've gone through all of their elementary and junior high and middle school, and maybe some of their first college classes, then maybe we'll, uh, we'll hand them uh, a choral sheet, uh, a choral piece, or an instrument, and then they can really start to, uh, to, to, to do the practical parts of it. But for the most part, we just want them to understand this sheet music. And the artist, of course, his nightmare is of a world where all art, it's, it's well-funded, it's mandatory. They have AP art classes, AP paint-by-number classes, because really it's all <laughs> about the methods you use. Ooh. And really, at the end, you still get the nice picture. And you maybe won't even get to see a blank canvas for art until you're in uh, your PhD thesis for art. Ooh. And what he basically says is, that sounds really bad, doesn't it? Well, we're doing that with math. <laughs> the way that we teach math is completely devoid of the beauty of it as an artistic endeavor. And we're really mainly concerned about teaching people how to do the things we've already figured out. Hmm. And it's very interesting. As I've said, I am six pages in. 
it is a roughly it's a 25 page document uh in the pdf that i have as a source but um yeah we we need to have a better idea of how to look at math as a subject because no wonder people find it boring and stale and mechanical it's because we're tr- we're looking at it as if it's a piece of mechanism <laughs> And some mechanisms are beautiful. Exactly. Uh, says, says the math teacher, the math finder. <laughs> Precisely. Uh, what was the title again? Uh, a Mathematician's Lament. Mm, that sounds fascinating. Um, what you said has given me two ideas, and they're both rather abstract. One, like you, is a recommendation of what not to do. And this particular <laughs> recommendation is to not, you, you, you said, let's not. Um, Establish as shibboleths things that are outside scripture. I'm going to say, let's not take two or three or four or five arbitrary things in scripture and mm. set them apart as these are the things that we really need to emphasize uh, if we really want to change things also or true. be spiritual or make a difference or have a successful church or whatever your particular goal might be. There, There is this danger to say that... that Basically, the mentality is God has some secrets, and the church, by and large, has ignored them. Maybe some previous generation, like the Reformers, the Puritans, or the Victorians, or the Founding Fathers, somebody found some basic principles and ideas. And if we just readopted those <laughs> and emphasized those, then we could change everything. Well, you know, worldviews and religion and faith don't work that way. They don't mm-hmm. come in bits and pieces. That's not to say that some ministry can't take one particular thing and see it as its strength. For instance, Kim ha- Ken Ham does a wonderful job with, with creation, but he knows that's not the, all there is to the faith, and, and that's his strength, And he, but he man- manages to maintain balance. And you can look at other people who emphasize other things, and, and they say, I am emphasizing this because it's my calling and strength, not because this is all there is to Christianity. But sometimes neophytes will come along and say, oh, this guy, he's so great. He's so fascinating. He keeps talking about these three or four or five, six things. That's what it must all be about. Like, no, he knows a whole lot more than you do. He's talking about these things because he's making some points. He's already assuming everything else you're supposed to know and don't yet. Mm-hmm. So knock it off. Quit going for just the few things and learn the whole scope and beauty of the Christian faith. It's not nuts and bolts. It's not rods and levers. It is an organic thing uh, energized by the Spirit of God and and, and coming together in the person of Jesus. And when we start doing that, we basically dehumanize and de-deify, undeify Jesus. We turn him into, usually what happens is we push him aside in pursuit of our principles. So there's that. The second thing and this, this is coming out of some personal experiences that I won't go into. But the second thing, and, it, and again, it kind of aligns with what you're talking about, I think, is my recommendation is read broadly. We all, for our callings or for our interests, read particular things, mm-hmm. particular areas, because we like them. We enjoy them. We're good at them. They fascinate us for right now, maybe for a lifetime. But most people are sensible enough to know that there is more to life well, act on that a little bit <laughs> yeah. and read beyond what you normally read. Uh, in my case, people who know me, I think, or kind of know me, I guess, probably think that I do a, a lot of reading in sci-fi and fantasy. I don't. Both those genres mostly bore me and irritate me more than anything else, <laughs> with, with, with a few exceptions. Yeah. Uh, re- enjoying Lord of the Rings and Narnia is not an excuse to read every fantasy novel or series by every unbelieving hack writer of the 20th century. I, I and, and sci-fi, classic sci-fi with all of its details and mechanics. And yeah, I don't know. It's not that interesting to me, honestly. I'm, I am a mystery buff. I read mystery stories and generally British cozies, you know, <laughs> Five or six people in a small village, or even just in one room, and somebody's, and you have the the, the detective and you know, all that. Uh, but this week I was reading for my class, for teaching my class, um, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky. Hmm. And I had forgotten Excellent. what a beautiful book it is. Uh, I mean, you are stuck in the mind of a murderer, so there's that, <laughs> but that's a different kind of experience. 
And I am, and, and I found myself actually thinking, oh, I could pick up my mystery novel. No, wait, Crime and Punishment sounds like more fun right now. Whoa, what did I just say? <laughs> um, it's a, but it's it, a mystery of a sort. It, it, it is, but that's not what's pulling me in as such. Mm, I see. Oh, although maybe there's something there. I should think about that. Uh, meanwhile, the members of my family are reading all kinds of books on all kinds of subjects, and, and everybody finds something interesting. We find out that there's more to life than even theology. Um, we, we Here and amongst us as we talk, yeah, we bring up theology books, and we certainly try to center everything around Scripture itself. But I think if you went back and looked at, did some kind of auto search on all of our comments on titles and authors, <laughs> you'd probably find that most of it is not theology. It's everything else. Because it it gives us a place for our theology to go and gives us ways of illustrating and developing our theology. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and when, when I say theology, we're talking about knowing God. Yeah. It, it, you know God better when you know his world better, when you know other people better. And one way to get at that is to not just read your devotional books, but to read other things as well. But don't yeah. give up reading the Bible. Don't sacrifice that. I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of blatantly Christian media of the past 30, 40 years is bad is because they're like, well, we can't just talk, we can't just tell a story about life. It has to have a devotional evangelistic quality to it or else it can't right. be considered Christian. Yep. Yep. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> that is a, a a weird closing note to end on, but it, we'll we'll go ahead with it. Um thank you all so much for joining me for this conversation. It was wonderful. Uh, Thank you to our listeners for joining us this episode. We hope you join us for more if you don't already. If you would like to follow us, you can do so uh, at our YouTube, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page and uh, any podcast catcher that exists we are on. If we're not on one, please let us know. You can send us an email at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com to let us know what you like or ask us questions. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, You can also support us at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much to those of you who do support us through Anchor. It helps us produce this show and bring it to you. And thanks to David Maxson for all of his editing work to bring these uh, episodes to our listeners. We look forward to seeing you next time and have a great one.